So welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. I'll admit folks as they come in, but I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Blake Kimsey and uh, I am the executive director of Writing Workshops Dallas. And together with David Samuel Levinson and uh, Alexandra Vandekamp down at Gemini Inc. Uh, Alexandra is the uh, executive director. We are just so thrilled each month to get together and bring to you the Big Texas Read. And we're really excited about our, our um, guests tonight. And before we start every Big Texas Read, um, we like to thank our sponsors, um, Humanities Texas for starters. Uh, they have given us a very generous grant um, for the work that we do here um, at the Big Texas Read. Um, we love to thank um, the University of Texas at San Antonio Library System. Each month, they always help us spread the word about our, our featured reader and author. And uh, we really appreciate them doing that. We um, love Lone Star Literary. Even if you're dialing in from outside of the state of Texas, Lone Star Literary always does a great job also of supporting um, the mission here at the Big Texas Read, and they spread the word far and wide. Um, and our independent bookstores, uh, the Twig Bookshop in San Antonio has been with us from the start, as has uh, Interabang Books up here in Dallas. And so we know how important our independent bookstores are, and we're thankful that we get to call those two our sponsor bookstores for the Big Texas Read. Um, and without further ado, I do wanna, um, we'll hand it over to David in just a minute to introduce our special guest tonight, but I'll let Alexandra say something about Gemini Inc. And I'm just so thrilled that we get to partner with you all, Alexandra. Oh yeah, thanks Blake. Um, so this was the brainchild of the pandemic and it's got great quote unquote literary feet <laughs> and it just keeps going. And um. You know, I'm the executive director of Gemini Inc. We are San Antonio's Writing Arts Center. We have been around for 27 years, everyone. Okay, I feel like we're the literary engine that keeps going up that hill. Um, and I'm ex extra excited about tonight because we have Octavio Quintanilla, who is the 2018 to 2020 San Antonio Poet Laureate. And he's really a, a groundbreaking artist doing amazing things with the visual and the literary. And we're going to see some of that tonight with his amazing front textos. And I'm so delighted that the um, uber talented Natalia Trevino is our guest moderator. So just know this is what Gemini loves to do, bring people together with great writers, um, have writers find new audiences and just teach people the craft of writing to bring their stories to life. And Octavia is doing a pretty amazing job of bringing stories to life. So with no further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to David who will introduce our two featured um, literary individuals tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandra. Okay, so I will start with our gorgeous moderator who was born in Mexico. Natalia Trevino is the author of Virgin X, Finishing Line Press, and Lavando La Dirty Laundry, Mongrel Empire Press, which has been translated into Albanian and Macedonian and published in Macedonia in 2021. Her work has won several awards, including the Alfredo Cisneros de Moral Award, the Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Prize, the Literary Award from the Artist Foundation of San Antonio, the Minada Literary Award from Macedonia and several others. Natalia is a graduate of the University of Texas at San Antonio and the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Can I ask you something quickly, Natalia? Yeah, sure. Do you know, do you know Timothy Shepard? No, I don't. Oh, okay. He was from Nebraska. Anyway, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, she works as a professor of English and as an affiliate Mexican-American studies faculty member at Northwest Vista College. Her publications appear in Open Plaza, Plume, the Southern Poetry Anthology, Border Senses, Borderlands Texas Poetry Review, Sugar House Review, the Taos Journal of Poetry and Art, and several others. Her work also appears in several anthologies, including Mirrors Beneath the Earth, Curbstone Press, Contra, Texas Poets Speak Out, Flower Song Press, Puro Chicanics, Writers of the 21st Century, Cutthroat Press, and most recently in Cha, uh, Chamisa. Ch Chamisa, 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 a journal of literary Performance and Visual Arts of the Great Southwest University of New Mexico Press. Is that University of Mexico Press? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, you are so incredibly fitted. You guys have really long bios. 
Um, and our featured writer tonight is Octavio Quintanilla, who's the author of the poetry collection, If I Go Missing. Is it Sloth Press or Slough Press? Slough Press, that's how I know they pronounce it. Great, I got it wrong both times. Slough Press, 2014, and served. he served as the 2018 to 2020 Poet Laureate of San Antonio, Texas. His poetry, fiction, translations, and photography have appeared or are forthcoming in journals such as Salamander, Rhino, Alaska Quarterly Review, Pilgrimage, Green Mountains Review, Southwestern American Literature, The Texas Observer, Existere, a Journal of Art and Literature, and elsewhere. His uh, Frontextos visual poems have been published in Poetry Northwest, Gold Wake Live, Newfound, uh, Chachalaca, I love that, Chachalaca Review, Chair Poetry Evenings, Red Wedge, the Museum of Americana, About Place Journal, the American Journal of Poetry, the Windward Review, Tapestry, Twisted Vine Literary Arts Journal, and the Langdon Review of the Arts in Texas. Octavio's visual work has been uh, uh, exhibited at the Southwest School of Art, Presa House Gallery, Equinox Gallery, UTRGV Brownsville, the West Laco Museum, Honoreus Gallery in San Antonio, Texas, Our Lady of the Lake University, and Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio, Texas. Um, hold on, I lost my place. Uh, Allstate, Almaguer Art Space in Mission, El Centro Cultural Hispano de San Marcos, the Walker's Gallery in San Marcos, Texas, and in the Emma S. Barrientos Mexican American Cultural Center, Black Box Theater in Austin, Texas. He holds a PhD from the, from the University of North Texas and is the regional editor for Texas Books in Review and poetry editor for the Journal of Latina Critical Feminism and Four Voices de la Luna, a quarterly literature and arts magazine. Octavio teaches literature and creative writing in the MA MFA program at Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio, Texas. Welcome to you both, and thank you for being here. Wow, thank you, David. That yeah, um, this Octavio's bio is is poetry in itself, and so widespread and so beautiful. And I'm just so happy and honored to be the moderator for tonight's Big Texas Read. Um, one day I was leaving Our Lady of the Lake campus when Octavio had brought me in to talk about my poetry with his students. And, and afterwards we were talking about our other projects. This is probably 2014 or 15, I'm not sure. And, and how our poetry was going, you know, as you do. And, and he said he had started and had always been a visual artist. And I was like, really? Wow. And it sort of, the light changed when he said that and we, and because there was such a light in him when he said this and he he talked about how much he missed it and we've had this conversation a, a couple of times um and what i think is so interesting is that right now his artwork is far from going missing anymore we are surrounded by it in our city we are surrounded by it in our literary world, in our circles. He's so generous with it. It is here and it's with us tonight. And everyone hopefully received a, a free, beautiful chat book, The Poem Machine. So Octavio, welcome. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, thank you, David, for that introduction. Thank you, Blake, uh, for being here, for you know, uh, being part of this uh, reading series. Thank you, Gemini Inc. and Alexandra. Uh, I really appreciate you all selecting my, my book uh, for tonight. And uh, I look forward to reading some poems and I have about 10 minutes to read. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make use of the time to, to introduce you to, uh, to the book if you haven't had a chance to look into it. And uh, and also uh, I want to show you some of the new uh, visual poems, some of the visual art that I've been doing lately. Um, and then 
we can take it from there. Uh, before, I want to read a, a, a brand new poem. I don't know if it's a poem or um, uh, a poem in prose. I was listening to W.S. Merwin today and he, he made the difference between, between a prose poem and a poem in prose. And I thought it was really interesting. So I'm gonna call it a poem in prose. Or no, I'm gonna call it a prose poem. Uh, you can find the interview on YouTube. Uh, so I want to read that poem, this poem, because it kind of gives you context of some of the things that I've been thinking about in terms of, of my poetry and uh, where I'm going and, and where I've been. And, also, and then I'll read a, a poem from If I Go Missing, and I'm probably just going to have time to read one. And then I'll go to, uh, to my uh, visual work so, so you all have a, an idea of, of what I'm doing. So this is uh, practically, you know, brand new. Uh, and it's called Drawing the Line. I think in images, metaphors, similes. And maybe this way of thinking has to do with my interest in lines. The poetic line, the doodled line, the continuous line shaping the M in the palm of my hand. In Mexico, when men would meet in a field, I would often see one of them often my father pick up a stick and draw lines on the ground. What did he draw? Who knows? I was seven or eight years old. Memory's line doesn't reach that far. But I like to think that maybe his doodling on the ground with a stick as he talked to his friends was a way to emphasize what he was saying. Or maybe it was his way of communicating with the earth and the way I try to communicate with the world when I pick up a pen and start making lines on paper. I must confess that it has been a while since I have reread Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. But in it, if I remember correctly, Steinbeck gives us a short description of jobless man standing around at the, at the height of the Great Depression contemplating what's to come, and then someone squatting and drawing lines on the ground with a stick. What is it about the line, the poetic line written or drawn on the earth with a stick that enthralls me? What is it about the line sketched in the deep blue sky like Raul Zurita's poems? that intrigues me. I must say, I do not have a definitive answer for this line of questioning, but I'm almost sure that just like my father and Steinbeck's characters and Raul Zurita, I too am trying to give my life shape with lines. For now, this is enough. So that's uh, my poem for my love for lines. <laughs> and uh, I'll read a, a poem from If I Go Missing. <clears throat> and it's called I Keep Returning to the Days. I keep returning to the days before I began to lose my hair, to the days before I lost a tooth in a bar fight to the nights when the love of my life was not much older than my oldest daughter. I'm not lost, I am here, a bystander at the margins of this great universe where there's no such thing as miracles. Mary never had an immaculate conception. Jesus never rose from the dead. Those who sleep well that night have never had their wrists slit by worry. The rest of us, potential suicides. Let's face it, it's hard to keep a straight face once our disappointment puts on a gray coat, a black hat, and drives around the city looking for God, wanting to know the truth. Documents get burned every day. Things that evoke memory also get lost. Some are left behind at bus stations or at parks where people set themselves on fire with loneliness. But there must be a star in this great galaxy that knows the true place and time of my birth. 
I'm driving again, lit by the car's headlights. The road seems to go on forever. Okay. Thank you. So uh, now uh, I'm going to show you some contextos. Uh, some of you here are familiar with them. Some of you might not be. And uh, I have a, about 25 images and uh, I'm gonna go pretty fast and I'll stop on some just to maybe translate the text because I find that interesting. Uh, and as I do that, I'll talk about the project and, and what I've been doing with it. So, here we go. Can everybody see that? Okay. So from Textos and uh, and uh, from Texas is like the overall, the, the umbrella of all, what I call of all of my visual work. And in this case, uh, the series that I'm working with is called Abstract Borderland. Um, and uh, uh, this work is, I'm doing it on paper. And if you're following, if, we, if we're connected on social media, you've probably seen some of the images here, uh, but maybe it'll be interesting to see them all together. Uh, and I worked on the Frontextos. Uh, I started working on them in uh, 2018. Uh, I think I, okay, I, I'm trying to go back, but it's not going back, so. <laughs> okay, there you go, I think I got it. <laughs> anyway, um, I started uh, doing my frontextos. Uh, it's a blending of two words, frontera and texto, uh, text and image, uh, and uh, a borderland and, and image. And uh, I, I started doing them every day. And if you remember, some of you might remember that at the beginning, there were all ink drawings on paper, uh, black and white. Um, and then finally, I started using color. And this is some of the work that, that that came out of that. Um, I write my the text overall. It's in Spanish. Uh, I really don't translate it unless uh, it's going to be published somewhere, and, and uh, the editors might ask for a translation. I'm happy to do that. Um, and as you can see here, uh, in most of the the new from textos, the abstract borderland, uh, the image kind of takes over the page even though you can still see the text here. And this one says, Oración por los desplazados, uh, prayer for the displaced. And, um, and, and I guess, you know, the idea is to have the text and then have the image and try to, the viewer, uh, to, to read into it, you know, to, to create a dialogue with, with what's being said and what's being suggested by the image itself. Um, and, uh, I, I'm realizing that this new series is very colorful and, uh, and kind of happy, which is okay. Let's see here. Uh, here you have another one. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, lately I've been working a lot on, on, I don't know if I should call it mastering, but working on, on getting better at blending color um, you know, used in different color fields and, uh, and, and still keep some type of uh, symmetry and, and form. Um, and this one says, El ayer es siempre hoy, uh, yesterday is always today. And I have no idea what that means, but it sounds really cool, poetic. Uh, here's another one. And, and, and then, uh, you know, even though the, the series is titled uh, Abstract Borderland, uh, I started doing some uh, figurative drawing to, uh, you know, to accompany the color. But uh, a lot of times in this series, I'm, I'm guided by color and I'm, I'm guided by, by the act of discovery. You know, there's a lot of layering, as you can see. And uh, 
I, I keep layering paint until uh, what I see uh, is attractive to, to my eye. Um, here you go with the lines. A lot of them have a bunch of lines. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, they're, I draw them freehand. So there's not a lot of, a lot, I mean, they're not straight or anything like that. I'm not using any, uh, anything to help me to, um, to, to mediate uh, the line. Um, and, and, and landscapes, I, I've noticed that, that throughout the series, you're gonna see uh, variations on, on, on similar themes and, and motifs, you know, uh, landscapes, faces. Um, I've noticed that there's a bunch of birds too, uh, and, and hearts. <laughs> uh, and uh, and here, here you have some more. Uh, and this one reads, ¿Qué parte de tu memoria duele? I can see it because of that. I think it reads uh, the, okay, there you go. ¿Qué parte de tu memoria te duele cuando tienes hambre? Uh, what part of your memory uh, hurts you when you're hungry? Uh, and, and also obviously one of the challenges for me is to not just create an image, but also uh, create a text and, and one line or maybe two lines that, that can be poetic. Uh, um, because sometimes I don't want to put text on the image itself and sometimes I do, but um, And uh, uh, here's another uh, another landscape that I think it's more uh, uh, figurative. And in this case, I added text in the image itself. Um, and lately uh, I've been doing a lot of this type of image where I draw something and then I cover it with, um, uh, with lines. Uh, in this case, I kind of realized that I was evoking like a cage and uh, mm -hmm. and then I'm also interested like in ascetic writing uh, and some of this work I, I do it when um, when I'm sitting down on the sofa and and I always have to have paper or something to write on. Uh, something to write with, and uh, and sometimes things like this uh, come out of that of those exercises. Wow! Yeah. Here you have more, and, and I think that uh, on this one, for example, I I remember just drawing the face, and then I started doing lines, and um, and then I started creating some type of pattern. Uh, so it, it's it, like a lot of times I don't go with, um, uh, you know, a, 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 an intentionality to, to draw or paint something specific. Sometimes it's just like I said, uh, having the paper in front of me, uh, having something to write with, and then uh, doing lines. I think I started this one with lines and then I started adding, adding layers. And then down here, I. I sketched like a, a virgen image. I know Natalia loves virgenes, <laughs> images of virgenes. Um, and, yes. and, and, and more than anything, uh, what I've been really interesting lately in, in this new work is just um, how colors, you know, how I bring colors to create a dialogue with each other. You know, that's a, that's a poem in itself, you know, to, to, and I was, we were, Natalia and I were talking earlier about how um, something that uh, can be very intentional, I, you know, the challenge is to make it look chaotic and, and I'm finished and I'm done, but we know it's done. You know, there's really nothing else I can add. Uh, and here are, here are some more. This is some of the most recent ones. And tonight, later on tonight after this, actually, I'm gonna post the, uh, uh, tonight's from Texto. Every night I post them on, on, on social media, Facebook or an Instagram. And I think I'm going to be on, uh, it's going to be 
number 90, I want to say 95 of the Frontexto, the abstract series, abstract borderland series. So uh, it's already going to be, I'm close to 100, uh, and which means it's 100 days of, of doing this and exploring uh, and, and using a very similar color palette, but, but still uh, doing things in such a way that I still try to differentiate uh, the textures. So another one. And, and, I, and I was telling Natalia that when I was doing this from text, I, I remember closing my eyes and, 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 and I don't know if you can see my, the cursor, but I was doing the little lines, you know, with my eyes closed because I wanted something uh, a little bit uh, unplanned and spontaneous. And, and it's kind of risky because, you know, uh, you can mess up the whole thing, but, <laughs> but it's all good. Anyway, that's that's my my presentation on the frontextos and a little bit of background on on what I'm doing and, um, and thank you for listening. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you so much for showing those. I mean, we could just linger on them I, I, all all day <laughs> for days and days. And 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 when you said you they're nearing a hundred, that's from this series because I know you're reaching this way series. more than a hundred. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. hundreds because this has been daily since 2017 yeah. Yeah. this yeah. process and so, the first time oh go ahead and I was just gonna say yeah January the first is gonna be four years January the first I start my fifth year of yeah. of posting a one front texto a day so I don't know 360 365 times four how many is that who knows I don't even know where they are, but we'll, find <laughs> well, they're it. on. They're 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 permanently in the interwebs. They're out there. They're yeah. floating around. And and the first time I saw the very first one, I thought, ah, oh, that's right. He is a visual artist. This is where it's coming from. Now he is exploring that yeah. bravely uh, to share what spontaneously is coming out of the artist, which is so, it's, it's so brave to do that, to, for an artist to let things see, appear, published, but maybe they're in process. Right. Um, I, I cannot know what is at the heart of your Frontextos, Octavio, but I know what I sense or feel, and they seem to point to maybe fragments of a larger story, you know, a journey, I think a journey of many, many corners of the consciousness, a dream world, a, a memory world, and, and even the world of the living and the non-living, the, the brave and the honest conscience. There's so much, like you said, dialogue, which is, um, and to do it honestly, I think that's what is struggling to survive in the truly awake artist. Is how do I handle my conscience in this world that's always tearing it apart. Right. Um, I, I also see documentation as a major theme in your work, the act of documenting, correcting, changing the document, which is at the core of who we are as writers and people. And you and me both, especially Octavio, both transplanted here from Mexico as children. So this is something I notice in a lot of work of Latin, Latinx authors, the, the feeling of needing to say, to tell, to document, mm -hmm. because how much of our identity and, and uh, is the question, you know, is linked to our documents, you know, since children, documentation. Right, yeah. No, uh, yes, uh, I think, I think this project of Frontextos, uh, is becoming my way to document my my stay in this world, my everydayness, you know, and and uh, you know, and I, I I'm sure you agree that not everything that I do is great, but I'm doing it, you know, and, and it goes back to what you said, this idea of of committing myself, not necessarily to the end product, but to the process, you know. Uh, in the last four years, I've learned so much about, about drawing, about painting, about writing, 
uh, about commitment. Uh, uh, and, you know, and, and it's not just writing and drawing and painting, it's reading. It's, uh, it's an education. I'm, I'm basically, you know, I, I should give an, uh, an MFA already. <laughs> You know, <laughs> Your own MFA. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's three years, you know, of, of, yeah. of constant study, yeah. practice, uh, construction and deconstruction uh, of what I do. And, uh, and I think it's, it's uh, I think it, it has to do with what exactly what you said, which is um, uh, documenting and um, fighting in a way oblivion and forgetfulness and uh, and to and to tell a story that otherwise nobody will tell about one individual me right that at the same time uh, implicates yeah. uh, community it implicates so family it implicates those who came before me and those who come after me it's not just me at the end of the day yes I, I'm I'm the soul that sits down at night at you know three four a.m. in the morning, uh, reading or, or drawing or painting or mixing paint or whatever. But but it's not just me. It's 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 everything that that I remember. And I think one of the the big themes in my work uh, in the, my lyric poetry and also in the visual work uh, po uh, poems is is memory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and you said about the you know the idea of. Uh, being transplanted from one country to another, uh, I, I feel like my memory has a, a very concrete line of uh, where I was and where I am, and what I remember from where I was and what I remember uh, from being here in this new country. So there's always that tension between between uh, who I remember uh, I was in mm -hmm. Mexico, for example, and who I am now. And, and also, uh, you know, the, the, uh, all the complications of, of writing, I don't know if truth is the right word, of writing about your life, you know, and, and at the same time knowing that a lot of it is mythology because you can't remember. That's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting what... Uh, uh, what you're talking about how the, there's always this border in the in your memory like an actual line that's drawn and how often that border appears in so many of your works and we're drawn to that as as viewers so we're so drawn because a lot of us have borders inside of us that we're crossing and you're sort of you're giving us these visual abstractions of some of those crossings your own but then we get to interpret with with the openness of, of your work. Um, so yeah. that's really just so valuable. And the um, bravery that it takes an artist to reveal their work in, in process and to, um, to allow um, erasures to appear. I know that it was at first called Borradores, which um, yeah. are our little notebooks, right? Yeah, yeah. Borradores uh, at the beginning, and, and you know, this goes back to uh, you know when I, the first six months that I started doing the Frontexos, I used to call them borradores, uh, which in, in Spanish it can be translated to a draft, you know, and I and and obviously for me at that time, uh, I wanted to make sure that my audience knew that it was a draft because I was not. I was still kind of unsure of myself, yeah. insecure in the work that I was doing. And I didn't want somebody to say, that's not a fucking poem, you know, or, <laughs> or you know, this sucks. Or so by calling them borradores, I'm like, I was, it was a, it, I was protecting myself. Right. But mm -hmm. then there came a time when I'm like, uh, you know what, this is my thing. This is my work. Yeah. And this is a process. You know, I want my, my audience or, or my readers or people who like my work to see me work every day and knowing that not everything's going to be perfect. And, but, I, I want, but someday something, I'm going to do something really good that, <laughs> that, 
that's, that's going to cool. be attractive uh, to someone, yeah. uh, which is interesting because most of the time I, I do something and I like it and I love it. And I think, oh, everybody's going to love that. Nobody does. But when I do something, <laughs> I'm like, oh, this sucks. Everybody loves it. So I don't understand that. But that's always a tension, right? Yeah. <laughs> So I was listening to Sandra Cisneros talking to us at Macondo recently, and she 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 gave a little talk, and she said, "I'm a rough draft." <laughs> She's like, "I'm not a, I'm not finished." So be be careful with me, you know, as, as a person. And there's something very vulnerable about revealing your rough draft. And I, and I know you've let go of calling it borradores, and I'm really glad that you talked about why. But what, one of the things that happened with this um, process that we're seeing is uh, that really engages, I think those of us who are watching and uh, those of us who see your work in a gallery up here or for the first time here, all curated and bonito and everything is that you're tapping into our imagination, what our birthright, what we were born with and our, um, the tension that exists between what, who we are and what we wanna create and what we wanna leave. So that's that's a really great that's a great service um, that you're doing for um, any artist, and I count that as almost any any person born with with the gift of an imagination. And I think every single child is born with that. So I am I'm, I see this as a, as a great service because it engages us. It makes us see the possibilities that um, color and light and drawing belongs to everyone. Right. And also, you know, going with that, with that point, uh, I, I kind of, I would really want, like, specifically, like, students or young people to, uh, to be encouraged to, you know, to take risks, to, um, you know, because, I mean, one of the things that sometimes sets us back is our own uh, self-doubt, like, you know, like, the reason why I called it Borradores, right? Uh, oh, I can't do that, or... Or I, I'm gonna keep doing this in in, in, uh, in solitude in my own, you know, without showing it to anybody until I do it perfectly. By that time, you're you know you're close to dying, you know. Yeah. Sure. Uh, by that time, you've wasted so much time to show the world how something can be done. That's why I you know I love I love to see artists paint. Uh, I love to see notebooks, you know, Leonardo da Vinci. All the artists who have sketchbooks, I love that because I'm like, yeah, this is this is human right here. Yeah, the it's so hand. alive. Yeah, this and is that's the, what I see in in like where you said you closed your eyes. You know, it's just so alive when you uh, when you go there, and that's incredible. Um, yeah, I want to we we we're gonna open it up for questions at eight o'clock. So I want to take us a little bit to talk about your beautiful book. If I go missing and some parallels that I see in that book and the chapbook that you shared with us, The Poem Machine, right. uh, which reminds me of uh, Mark Doty's Sweet Machine and the idea of the machines inside of our bodies all of the time. So as I read If I Go Missing or reread it, um, I was aware that a, a story was unfolding. It was a seductive narrative, meditating on loss and death, and displacement and the beauty of the body that may have gone missing that, and that needs to be told. It's the body needs to be told is what I keep seeing in that book. The body needs to be unfolded like the pages um, and the body needs to be reclaimed. And I, I feel like I'm talking about your visual art too, but I'm talking about that book. And it's interesting that the themes are really similar, but can you talk a little bit about how you put this book together under this incredible conditional sentence fragment. So, uh, you know, I, I, I put it on the board today with my students as a fragment and then let them talk about how there's so many possibilities after the words, if I go missing. But can you talk a little bit about how you, how that book came together for you when you were? Yeah, uh, a, a lot of those poems I wrote uh, during my stay at UNT, working on my PhD for my dissertation. Um, and, uh, I, you know, when I graduated, I, I had a manuscript, but I know I didn't have a book. So uh, I spent the next three years working on it. And uh, then I found myself writing a lot of new poems 
Uh, so I got to a point where I had to stop because sometimes, you know, like I was working on the manuscript and I was, I will take older, what I thought were older poems and I will put new ones. So the character of the manuscript was changing of the narrative, you know? Oh yeah. It does so, change. That's right. Yeah. Because, and that's, that's great. But, but Actually, uh, really mysterious but and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I still felt that I had a story to tell here. Like uh, the, the new poems were telling a different story. They were telling, they were seeing the world with a different, a, a different eyes, right? So I stopped doing that, and I just revised the poems that I had. I um, and, and then I, I started working with the structure, um, you know, just uh, uh, to to build a, I guess, a, not necessarily a linear narrative, but just you know to have coherence, you know, to to have a structure. And then at the end, what I did, once I had all the parts together, uh, I moved like, you know, I, I divided it into three parts. Mm -hmm. I got like half of one part and put it at the end. Then I got half of the, uh, the final part and put it at the front. Mm -hmm. and, that, and when I read it, I put it away. And when I read it uh, anew, uh, even though everything that I had planned for, you know, at the beginning changed, it still mm -hmm. made sense to me. Like everything was still kind of fitting together. The motifs and themes were still echoing each other. You know, they were creating dialogues. So I knew that that the book was ready uh, in my mind. You know, and um, and the the last poem, one of the new poems in the book is "If I Go Missing." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that's one of the poems that I actually kept uh, from the new poems that I was writing, mm -hmm. and. I was having so much, I have so much uh, a hard time thinking of titles. <laughs> so I had a tons of titles for the book and they all sucked. I and, did too, actually. <laughs> uh, they, were, they, they were not doing their job. They were not capturing what I wanted to, what I was saying overall without being, you know, really direct and stuff. So right. I wrote that poem and I'm like, that's the title. <laughs> if I go missing, which is the last poem in, in the book. Uh, and, and I think at that time when, you know, 2010, 2018, um, I was living in the Valley, uh, 2011, the violence and, and across the border was really heavy. Right. Uh, every night I would see the news, you know, cause you get in from Mexico cause you're so close to the border. And at that time we didn't have cable or anything. So, right. uh, but you still got the news from Atamoros, Reynosa, you know, the border towns. Uh, just across the, the Rio Grande Valley. And there was always stories about people missing, going missing, kidnapped, found dead. Um, and even though the book is not necessarily focused on that, uh, there are poems that speak about that violence, right? Quite a, um, quite a bit. I mean, quite a bit of the middle section really yeah, does. And it's right. interesting when you said that the, you split the ending into two parts to make the beginning and the end, but the the I go part, which has that incredible and unforgettable epithet from Gloria Anzaldúa, Borderlands, that this thin, her home is this thin edged edge of barbed wire. That section is really taking us to a very specific time and place. Right, yes. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, you know, I had just graduated uh, from UNT. Uh, I had a job, this is 2010. Uh, one of one of my dreams was to graduate and and um, and visit the home the town where I grew up. Right, <laughs> uh, my parents still have a home down there. My my father was a farmer. He still has, uh, uh, you know, farmland. And uh, one of the dreams, one of my dreams, and my brothers was, hey, we want to go down there. It will be like a, a place to go and relax. Uh, you know, take our families. Uh, and in my mind, I was like, man, I'm going to invite a bunch of writer friends to come down here and, you know, write and hang out and create. And, and uh, but uh, like I said, it, it was horrible. You know, you, you know, that area where I grew up, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's Tamaulipas. I won't mention names or anything, but uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's cartel land there. You know, well, so and that again reminds me of what you're saying about the border. 20 years. Yeah. I mean, that, that again reminds me of how of the 
of the border inside, the, the split inside of your memory, what it was and what it and what it became later and just how how traumatic. Mm. I mean, it was a traumatic experience to go back and see it. So right. it changed um, so different. And one of the things I, I see in, especially in that section of the poem is, is the speaker um, trying to see the wholeness of it, like not looking away from the the matazones, the 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 secuestros, the the weight of this of this loss, but trying to see the humanity and how we survive, mm -hmm. and um, it's very it's very haunting and very mysterious, but you make it more. Um, I guess more clear, like what, what you're trying to ask, or it feels like you're trying to make it more clear by sometimes turning these, these abstractions into um, people that you can dialogue with. Like that you're talking about dialogue between color in a way, what I see a lot ha happening and if I go missing is dialogue between uh, abstractions, the, these, these gross inhumane abstractions. Yes. Um... Yeah, I can see that. And I think that the dialogue happens in, in a lot of the poems. Um, uh, like, I think you're like, right. Be between the abstract, between the dialogue that happens between an abstraction and then the concrete image. Yeah, exactly. You know? Like you have, even in what you read tonight, disappointment puts on a, puts on a coat. So it's more than just personification. It's, we're going to tell a story. Right, right about this, about how disappointment feels so that I can see it, and witness it as a person and somehow understand it better. Yeah. Um, and and you, you're, there's also so much hope though in, in that book and also at the end of your, the poem machine. Um, you end the poem machine with um, Mataderos, right. which I was wanting to read Matamoros, which, um, even the name of that place is violent. It means, you know, killing a black person. That's right. the yep. name of that city because the history is there right. of, of that violence, right? But your poem Mataderos is the last poem in your chapbook. It's just um, these five lines. We will survive the slaughter houses of our times. And while this is such a, um, the title which uh, is the killers, um, those who kill. Um, and we have the word slaughter and not just slaughter, but there's a line break there. We all go back and look at your book to put emphasis on slaughter houses. So we see all this blood, but this is a hopeful poem to me. Yeah. That, <laughs> we yeah. will survive. Exactly. And, and uh, you know, I'm so glad that you, uh, you're, you're commenting on, on that, which is really you're commenting on 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 the uh, on the craft, right? Uh, which is bringing together, juxtaposing unexpectedness, right? Uh, I could have taken that poem elsewhere. Yeah, but it's I could have made it dark. And, and if I go missing, you do mention some of the poems are dark and, and there's violence, but also there's, there's, uh, I, I try to um, uh, uh, negotiate that darkness with, with approaches like surrealism and, yeah. and, and very concrete images because I, I didn't want just blood and, and death. And, no, no, it's and not that. that. It's, so, and there's so much honoring of the beauty, even in the, um, the poem of the slaughter of the, the pigs with, with, with the brothers. Right. Matanza, yeah. de Matanza de Marrano. That is a beautiful description of the split of the body that you, that you describe. And, and yet we're, um, there's so much loss there too, loss of this right. tradition. Right. Uh, that that you're experiencing or or that you're documenting. Um, can we see that Mataderos poem? Like maybe as we we're almost done, but 
because I would love for everyone to see the way it plays with the Frontexto painting. Um, here, you want me to? Yeah, okay. and, and just would be great to have you comment on the structure of both, not just the topic, yeah. because the structure uh, to me, they seem to echo each other. Let's see here. Can you see that? Yes. So this is a poem that you're referring, Mataderos. Um, and as you can see, it's five, five lines, uh, two lines composed of one word. We will survive the slaughterhouses of our times. Um, and, uh, and here's the, the image. Let me make this a little bit smaller. And in Spanish, you know, you have uh, the text uh, uh, sideways. Uh, sobre viviremos <laughs> los tiempos de nuestros tiempos, right? Uh, and if you're holding the book, I mean, uh, reading it becomes physical. You have to move it around, you know, which I, I always find that interesting. When I'm in the street and I see somebody reading a book and then they go like that, I'm like, what are they reading? You know, that, <laughs> that's compelling to me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is the image. And, uh, and people uh, sometimes ask me, you know, what comes first, uh, the image or, or the text? And in this case, the image came first, you know? And also, uh, as you can see here, I was, you can see the blackout text where I was tinkering with the text. Yeah. I was editing myself, I was revising myself. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to, I, I wanted, you know, the, obviously it's an abstract, the image itself is abstract. So I wanted the text to be as concrete as possible and, and still go with, with, with the painting, with the image, you know? Um, and I, so I, much, I, there's so much in that image, Octavio, the, um, the, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, the the rose shark or is that how, I don't know how to pronounce that I shouldn't even say it but you know those rose shark images where you have to interpret right and your mind immediately has to go to um, you know what do, what do I what do I see there yeah. the psychological you know the test. psychological thing yeah. Yeah. yeah and then and then it becomes a blur and then it looks um, violent mm -hmm. and um, and light there's also so much light there sharp and um it very much feels like a moment in time like it's alive yeah it's it's not defined and and planned and it's it's challenging yeah to me so as you're talking i'm thinking about i mean this was what in 2018 i think or 2019 when i did it so but i remember doing this and i imagine myself um, in a slaughterhouse warehouse and I'm on top of the roof and I'm looking down and I'm seeing the blood and I'm seeing the evidence of what goes on there, you know? Uh, so that, that, I mean, that, that was, that's what I was thinking when I, when I did this, even though what's wonderful is that different viewers will see different things. But what I was seeing was blood on the floor and, and, uh, and and uh, and me being on top, looking down. Yeah, I can. I yeah. And and um, there is and by choosing black to go along with this idea, um, it it, it, it turns it into an abstraction, exactly. at least for me. Yeah. And makes me see it more clearly, I and it, it lets me see the that moment in time more. I don't know more vividly. Yeah, but I also think that it's interesting that the poem stands alone as itself on its own. It's not just a translation. But the way you constructed the poem stands alone, also with sharp lines and edges, and and just an equal challenge. And you move the word matado, mat, mataderos around. Mm -hmm. um, so it just I don't know. And it's interesting not. that that's your choice to end with. It's hopeful, but it's really a comment on the times that we're living the 20th right, this, right. this part of the 21st century right yeah um 
Well, well, thank you for that. I, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it sounds like it's successful. So <laughs> thank you for that. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I think everything you said and uh, fits uh, what's going on here. And you know what, sometimes when I do things, um, you know, you mentioned the black, the black ink, the black paint. Uh, I don't necessarily remember thinking this when I was doing it, but I'm thinking now, I think red would not have worked for this, for example. And, you know, that could be a subconscious decision. I think a lot of incredible things happen when we let the sub subconscious, when we free it. And I, and I see that it's, it is, this is why your work reminds me so much of Chagall too, that he's working with these, these, um, this psych, the, the logic of our psyche or the logic of our emotion or the associations through emotion and through images, right. um, really freeing himself from pictorial logic, right? right? right. And um, saying, I'm gonna do something with my inner landscape. Right, yeah. On the, yeah. On the page. Yeah, and, and you know, like I mentioned to you before at the beginning, uh, before we had an audience, uh, that, that's what really attracts me. You know, that, that type of, abstraction that that exploration of internal landscape and uh, another thing that I want you to notice is I talked about the layering and you can see here the remnants of something that was already there yeah that I probably painted or drew and I didn't like it so I did something else on top of it you know and and and, and that's something that took me a while to to get comfortable with to destroy something that I, I did, you know, uh, but something that was not satisfying me in any way. So mm -hmm. instead of keeping it, I, I decide to paint over it to, uh, yeah. you know, to do something different, you know. Uh, and, and in a way that brings it more to life, which is really what we're trying to do in the arts, I think. It's just bring it to life. How can we bring it to life? Well, add dialogue. Well, add this. Well, we add, you know, a moment of, of revision. Yeah. Um, it doesn't escape me and I don't want it to escape our conversation. I know we're almost ready to open it up for questions, but um, the today is the 15th of September, the 15th of September, which is uh, Mexican Independence Day. And um, it's celebrated tomorrow, but it really did happen today. Um, when the, um, the priest, um, other, now his name is, Grito de Dolores. yes, El Grito, de Dolores, yeah. El Grito de, de Dolores, exactly. So Father Miguel Hidalgo y Castillo was, he was fighting against the caste system that was in Mexico. Um, that was his, the Dolores was the caste system specifically that Spain imposed, New, Spain imposed on New Spain. And if, if we don't know what the, what the casta system was in Mexico at this time, um, it was a social grouping system that gave and took rights to people according to their ranking in the caste. In other words, if they were born in Spain, they were at the very top, they were the peninsulares, the actual Europeans. And if they were born of the Europeans, they were the next level down. And the further everyone went down, further away from the white skin, um, the less privilege they had. And the system, there's paintings of this, there's drawings of this, very clear with lines showing right. this is, um, but, but th this is a day where we celebrate independence from that or the cry against that. And then so much of your work, Octavio, is about independence. And so I just want to congratulate you on Independence Day on your independence. Thank you. <laughs> and just, you know, because you're a model. Oh, thank you for that. So many. Thank you. And, uh, and yes, I feel, uh, I feel free uh, in terms of uh, what I can create and, and what I, I want to create. You know, I really do. Um, and, and, and like I said, you know, I think one of the, the themes here in this conversation is to uh, take risks and to, uh, you know, uh, trust intuition 
your creative intuition. And uh, you're going to be learning as you go. You know, if you're really committed to it, you're going to yeah, you, you're going to put in the work. Yeah. And letting go of fear. Letting go of fear. I think that's big. That's yeah. big. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, that was so much fun. We can go on and on, but we're going to, I think other people, the chat looks great. I want to go back, go and read it and, um, and open it up for people to, I'll let Blake be in charge now, right? Like time for me to stop. Thank you everyone for listening. Well, brilliant conversation. It looks like uh, Cyrus has a question um, and I've just, uh, Cyrus is unmuted. So feel free. I, to I actually didn't. I was just clapping. Oh. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I put with, you the, spot, with a little gold hand. <laughs> but congratulations. What a dynamic interview. And I envy you. I keep telling myself I'm going to do some watercolors. Uh, during the pandemic, I started up with watercolors again. Oh, cool. but you've been an inspiration. Uh, you and Spencer Reese and Richie Hoffman. I look at your yeah. your your visual work and sort of drool. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's great to see you. Thank Congratulations you. on your being the laureate there. Thank you. Thank you for that. And and I do love uh, Spencer Reese's work. He's a he's great. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm so inspired by what you do there. Thank you, Cyrus. You're welcome. De nada. Anybody else? You can also put it in the chat if you don't want to. If you don't want me to unmute you, if you have any questions. This was our first kind of uh, multimedia experience where we had an artist, uh, you know, paired with their writing, and that was just so fun to see your work and the, and the, just the way you kind of go for it. And also, I just have to say, so inspiring as an aspiring writer myself just to let the fear go and to put it all out there. I mean, it, it really is, your multidisciplinary practice is very inspiring. And I, I thought that the conversation the two of you had really brought that out. So thank you for that tonight. Um, are there, are, if there's no questions, I mean, this, is, this has been such a brilliant conversation and so much has been covered, you know. Um, <laughs> so we'll kind of go once, go twice. But I would be remiss if I didn't thank you both for just an inspiring and in-depth conversation. So uh, we do have one uh, from Ariana. I, is it okay if I unmute you, Ariana? Or do you want me to, um, I'll, I'll just unmute you here, Ariana, and you can ask your question. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I feel like this might be a weird question, but how do you, when you're writing, how do you not make it feel so forced or planned? I feel like whenever I write, it doesn't feel natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, well, that's a great question. Uh, uh, I think, I think I kind of touched on that a bit and especially with the visual work, um, I keep layering stuff until I find something that just feels right. Uh, and in my narrative poems or lyric poems, I spend a lot of time with them. Um, and I, and I also, I spend a lot of time with them, but I also spend a lot of time apart from them. So every time I come back to them, I, I, I kind of, I, I want to feel like I didn't write it. And I, and I know that once I feel that I, that I, I didn't write that, <laughs> then I know that more than likely it's going to sound natural to someone else. You know, and Natalia and I were talking about how the challenge of making something hard look easy. Yeah. And, uh, and I, think that's, I think that's just part of the process. Uh, and in my case, I'm so invested in the process that I'm not rushing to get anything done. You know, I'm just waiting for it. I'm, you know, I have a, I wish I could show you, I have a canvas right here. 
And uh, I've been working on, on this painting and then I thought I was done, then I'm not done. Then uh, I asked my daughter to make some markings, some, you know, just mark it up, mess it up for me, please. So she started messing with it. I, today, before this, I started reworking it again. I started painting over that. And, until, and I know that it's gonna take days for me to, to say, okay, that's it, it's done. But I think when, for me, things feel unnatural, like you, like you say, is when, when I'm too hasty, when I'm not patient, when, when, I, when I feel like, a, you know, like when, when, I, when I rush something, when I force something and it's not ready, you know, sometimes I don't want to write, so I don't. I just scribble, doodle, do lines. So, so I think it's just a... Uh, you know, I don't know if this is advice or anything like that, but maybe it's just a way, just a, just to find your rhythm, you know, find your rhythm, find your pacing, um, be patient. Uh, I think that's one of the, for me, one of the key elements to be patient with, with a work, with a poem or a painting, just to be patient and, and not to, not to, uh, you know, force it. Um, you know, not, not to be impatient for it to get done, you know. <laughs> so just enjoy the process. And, and if you're writing lyric poetry or narrative, narrative poetry, uh, I suggest you kind of write something, put it away, keep coming back to it more than once uh, until, you, until, you, uh, until you find that natural voice, you know, that natural delivery. And that implies taking, off, taking up words, uh, rearranging lines, deleting stances, um, uh, maybe adding something that that allows the reader to to enter the poem. You know, um, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> I think it's a great response, and I and I. One of the things I, I heard in what you said too is just revealing what's really, what you're really feeling and forgetting about the ego and who's gonna see it and what are they gonna think? Does that kind of, sometimes that stops us from feeling yeah. that, from letting our nature come out, like our actual right. true nature come right. out, what we call in the Tao, our, our true self. Right, right, yeah. Writing like, uh, I think most of the, the work that I like the most is when I write like, like me, like the person, like Octavio, as opposed to the guy that thinks it's a writer. You know, <laughs> that guy is like, he, he wants to impress people. But when I write me, like with my emotional, you know, uh, as honest as I can, uh, without that persona, even though automatically you're already creating a persona, right? If you're writing a poem or whatever, but without that persona that I create for myself, I think that's when the writing comes out just honest and, and, and uh, I'm learning to trust it because I, sometimes I don't, I'm like, no, this is, this is not it. I'm too vulnerable here or, or no, this is so simple, so easy. Uh, I should be doing harder stuff or more complex crap, you know? <laughs> but but I'm learning to trust it. I'm learning to trust this guy writing the poem as opposed to the guy who thinks he's a writer writing the poem. So real self-awareness there. <laughs> and, Octavio, some people were put in the chat um, how one person wrote, do you do all of this on paper? And another person put in there, uh, how can we get your work? Uh, yeah, you can uh, just go to my website. Uh, uh, Alexandra can probably type it down there, uh, OctavioQuintanilla.com. She did. Uh, you can order my book, uh, If I Go Missing, from there. Uh, also, if you're not familiar with my, my Frontextos and you want to connect, uh, you can do it through Instagram at, at, writer, uh, at writer Octavio Quintanilla. I post uh, a Frontexto every, every night, evening. 
and you can, you know, if, if you need something or you have a question, you can contact me through there. And um, also somebody, uh, Martha Road, would you mind closing reading, reading a poem, closing the reading with a poem? Absolutely. Is, is, is it that time for me or not yet? <laughs> we have time for a little bit more okay. questions from yeah. Or another, yeah. There's a uh, paper. There's a what about there. what about your paper question that was up there? Uh, paper question. I didn't see that. Um, I'm seeing one and also here. music. There was a question about do you how do you, do you inspire yourself with music or how do you get into a creative mood? Mm. And then someone also said, are all of these on paper? And they might want to articulate more about what they oh. what they're asking about. Right. Uh, well. A lot of the uh, abstract borderland is on paper. Like right now I'm working on this one here. But as you can see in the back, the from textos, I'm doing them on canvas now too. And I just had a, an exhibit in, at the Brownsville Museum of Fine Art of 20 from textos. All of them had text and um, I conceptualized it as a, as a book. So. <laughs> Uh, so it's kind of cool just playing with that type of thing. Um, uh, what else? Uh, but yeah, most of my work is on paper because I don't have, I don't have the space to, to have a lot of canvas work. Uh, if, if I did, I, I would, but uh, I, I focus on paper right now and some canvas, but not too many. Uh, as far as music, you know what's interesting? Um, I don't listen to music when I start something. Like when I'm starting some, uh, a, uh, a frontexto, for example, or a poem or a painting, I, I don't listen to music. I need quiet. Like it, it's, it's really loud in here. <laughs> I don't wanna sound crazy or anything, but uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in my head that I don't want another layer of sound, you know? When I listen to music and I love it, it's after I have the first draft down whether it's a, a lyric poem or a painting, once I have something to work with, now I, I, I can listen to music and, uh, uh, and, and listen to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and that, that's inspiring sometimes, you know, like, mm -hmm. like sometimes I listen to a song that I heard for a long time and, and I just get a, you know, a handful of paint and smear it on the canvas, you know, things like that. Um, but <laughs> that's so great. But when I first start, it's quiet. I need a lot of quiet. Um, you know, that's, that's me. Uh, there was another question here. Um, how do you inspire yourself to write? Oh yeah, that's the music one, okay, yeah. And as far as inspiration, uh, you know, it's interesting and I've said it before and uh, uh, you know, I hope it makes sense to you, but uh, since I started doing this every day, like I don't, I don't finish a frontexto every day anymore. I have about, right now I have about 50 done, you know, that I don't have to work on one every day like I used to the first six months. The first six months, all day I was thinking like, what am I gonna draw today? What am I gonna write? Now I have so much work ahead of, uh, ahead of me that I can relax. Now I can actually spend more time on the pieces. You know, now I can, uh, Almost every mark becomes more intentional and, and uh, I can explain it and I can, you know, uh, reflect and talk, articulate its origin. Uh, before it was harder because uh, I was, the challenge was to do one every day so I can post it to social media, to Facebook. Now I have, I don't know, 50, 60 frontextos. And, and what's great is that going back to this idea of sounding natural, uh, those from textos, even though I could say they're done, they're really not. Because if I look at them, I'm like, ah, I'm going to add this right here. Or mm -hmm. this one it needs a mark here. <laughs> and, they keep and, changing as you keep changing, right? Right. That's right. And um, the, the only time I don't change anything is once I post it. Very few times, maybe once or twice, have I posted something? I said, no, nah, that, that's missing something. 
Mm. And then I go back and, and I fix it. Uh, but uh, living like that every day, you know, thinking, living in a creative way like that, you're always inspired. I don't know. You believe me, right? I definitely believe. I think <laughs> like a lot of people feeding, are gonna... it feeds me. It's feeding me. Mm-hmm. Like it's crazy. I, I don't like. I, you know, okay. and but at the same time, like I said, I don't have to sit down and write. I don't have to sit down or paint. But I'm thinking about it, and 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 you just. You know, uh, it, it just uh, become more in tune with the world. You recognize it. You know, uh, I forgot who said that art's about recognition, right? Re- recognizing the world, um, and, and that's what I do. Like nothing escapes me. Like everything is has potential for Frontex for art, for specifically for images. You know. And then I get obsessed, you know, like I've been obsessed with birds lately. You know, I think I want to escape somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is, I think a lot of us are in tune so much more with nature after being in pandemic and listening. Yeah. I am with birds. I'm always like, oh, there are the wrens. Oh, there are the titmice. That's, oh, you know, I'm that's always, right. Uh, I, I think. Uh, I think there's a longing in me to return to nature. You know, uh, as I told you, I grew up uh, in Mexico. You know, and helping my dad and 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 you know in the fields uh, with birds and cows and and rivers and streams and trees and those images appear a lot in my work, and and I've been disconnected from nature, and and I'm very happy when I when I go to a park with trees. I love trees. I love them, you know, and uh, I think there's something in me that wants wants to insert my hands in the earth, you know, to do. Maybe I'll start a garden or something. I don't know, but I need that. I need it, you know. It's, it's crazy. It's beautiful. It's crazy. I th- there's a. Uh two more questions and then I think we're it's time I think we're gonna run out and so right Blake yes yeah, so we'll we'll end here at 8 uh, 30 okay uh um so what, yeah there's uh, uh I guess is it Bobby uh wants to know if you've ever considered writing under a pseudonym <laughs> uh no I don't know. I don't think so. That's, that's a good question. I don't think so. Uh, I feel like uh, I used to hate my name as a kid. Now I, I kind of like it as a writer. Uh, I just don't know why I would do that. I mean, it's, I, I never considered it, but you know, uh, it might happen. <laughs> I don't know. Kind of like uh, Fernando Pessoa, right? Like he had all kinds of names and person. I mean, I love him. I love his writing, and it maybe something like that, something playful like that would be cool. It could be like, another a, a, an alter ego or something, you know. Uh, I'll call myself Natalia Trevino. Yeah, it's kind of also right. It's also kind of an erasure. I'll call myself Cyrus <laughs> Trevino. <laughs> <laughs> it's an erasure. It's like a new invention or a new persona, right? Yeah. 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 You have to recreate yourself. You know, it's like you're writing your own character. <laughs> uh, what else here? Um, How do you decide which from text to post? And I think that will be our last question. And then you can do a poem. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Uh, how do I decide? Um, well, there, there's two ways. One is how I'm feeling. Uh, or what am I, what excites me and what I've been doing. Uh, and the other one, sometimes I think about the images that I've been posting and I don't want it to be uh, 
to repetition, uh, too repetitious. I want it to be more variation. So I kind of juxtapose that type of, you know, like uh, something really uh, a figurative, you know, like drawing of a bird or, or whatever, or, uh, and then something very abstract. So, so the uh, audience can see the range, right? Because, um, you know, if I post the same thing over and over and over and over, I'll get bored myself. So, so there has to be that, uh, uh, that play and, um, and that uh, hope, hopefully element of surprise, you know, to surprise, like break your expectation as, as, a, as a reader and a viewer, you know? So, so I'm kind of guided by that. That's awesome. I keep hearing the word play, surprise, <laughs> invent, yeah. uh, learn, staying alive. I really, it's staying alive, isn't it? Staying alive, right. <laughs> Not taking yourself too seriously. You know? It's like having fun. And So you want me to end with a poem from the book? That would be awesome. Okay, so I'll read. Um... I'm going to read a poem that, you know how we have books sometimes in readings, so we only read like the same five poems all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll read a poem that I haven't read um, that I never read in public readings. And it's called Go Hungry. Go hungry every night so the stars may blaze like oranges in the moist sunlight. So the sky's mantle may bring your mother's table overflowing with her hands work. Chicken soup and tortillas with burnt edges, leather belts and coat hangers reminding you of bruises one must give for love. And that voice, eternal voice that spills to the floor like brick dust, fine and unrelenting. Gracias, Octavio. Mil gracias. Gracias a ustedes. Thank you all for being here. Uh, uh, all my uh, colleagues and friends and, um, and everybody who supports Gemini Inc. and uh, uh, Workshop Dallas and everybody who uh, supports this type of programming that it's necessary for our communities, I think. It truly is. Thank you both uh, for being here tonight. This was so fun. And that was such a great poem to end on. That was, I'm glad that you read that one for the first time here tonight. I love that, the brick dust. Um, well, thank you both. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, Alexandra down at Gemini Inc. and um, David up in New York and everybody who dialed in. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, we'll have a recording of this. We'll send it out to uh, the folks who RSVP didn't, but didn't make it tonight. And uh, we'll look forward uh, to more of both of your work uh, in the future. But thanks for such a great conversation tonight. Thank you, Blake. You were amazing. I loved this. I just wanted to like blurt that out. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I want to write 20 poems now, Octavio. You make me want to write a million poems. And thank you, Natalia. Beautiful questions. Yes, Natalia. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you all. Y'all are, this was so much fun. What a, what a great way to spend a, a beautiful night. Well, good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Nice to see you. Thank y'all. See you, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. See you next month. <laughs>